Good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. So while you're turning there, last week we started our Spring Psalms message series, and we're kind of giving everyone a little, a little bit of a taste of the book of Psalms, and we said last time that there are different kinds of classifications of the book of Psalms. As we know, there's songs, just like in songs, there's rap, there's country music, there's pop. There are different kinds of Psalms that God has written in His book, and it's 150 chapters, and they're all compiled into five books. And last week, if you were here, the kind of song that we talked about in Psalm 37 was a teaching kind of song. Today is also a teaching kind of song, but it's also a salvation song. This book, the Psalms, has really played a major part throughout the life of the church. In the 1500s, uh, Martin Luther, before he was converted to Christ, through the reading of the book of Romans, he actually taught the book of Psalms as a non-believer in the University of Wittenberg, Wittenberg in Germany. And also, he, he also had this uh, book, Psalms, considered to be the Bible in miniature. After his death, uh, they saw his book, his, his Bible, this, this worn out Bible, and there was one verse written in front of the Bible. It's Psalm 119, verse 92. So this book has changed his life. God has used the book of Psalms to save him from his sins. A lot of people today read the book of Psalms. It's their go-to book when they're going through trials and tribulations. Again, we, we hear this in funeral services, especially when they read Psalm 23. A very famous passage that most people hear about. It's the kind of book that really stirs our soul. It, it, act, it, it ministers to us. It influences what we're going through troubles and through troubled times. And today's message is entitled, Remember to Remember. Remember to Remember. It's a review of God's history of saving His people. So again, if you have your Bibles with you, Let's read it together, Psalm 78, and let's just read the first 16 verses today. This is what the scripture says. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell it to the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might, and the wonders that He has done. He established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites, armed with a bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to His law. They forgot His works and the wonders that He had shown them. In the sight of their fathers, He performed wonders. In the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan, He divided the sea and let them pass through it, and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime, He led them with a the cloud. And all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly. As from the deep, he made streams come out of the rock and caused waters 
to flow down like rivers. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for this wonderful passage that we're about to embark this morning, just for a brief time. And how it speaks about your faithfulness, how great you are and amazing, that throughout the centuries, you remain faithful. And as we hear from you, from your word alone, that you will change us from the inside out. God, we will leave today amazed by your grace and mercy and your steadfast love that never runs out. God, change us. Lord, if there's any pushback that we feel today, and we ask the Holy Spirit to, to speak to us, to minister to us, to deal with our sins and idols. And you will forgive us once again. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your life, death, and your resurrection power that we all have as believers in Christ. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, here's the main idea today. Tell the next generation God's faithfulness that it's not based on our sins, but on His loving kindness. Let me say that again. A very powerful statement in Psalm 78. Tell the coming generation that God's faithfulness is not based on our sins or our disobedience, but it's on His loving kindness. God's faithfulness is not based on our performance. And performance means if I make it up to God, then He will love me back. If I just clean up my life, then God would do this. If I do this, then He will do this for me. If I would stop this, if I would stop sinning and, and just be victorious in this certain struggle that I have in my life, then God will. And yes, we are called to be holy. We are called to be sanctified. Once we got saved, we are, being, we are in the process of being sanctified. It means growing up, being more like Jesus. We're in that process right now for those who believe. Yes, we need to clean up. We need to sober up. We need to grow up as Christ followers. But when we are faithless, God continues to be faithful to you and me. That's an amazing thing. And this is what Asaph, who wrote this song, and in the next 11 chapters, he wrote this song to tell us, to tell the people back then about God's faithfulness. Asaph was the praise and worship leader of King David. So he knew what was going on here. And he's asking for a passionate appeal to be heard. Look at verse 1 again. Let's read that. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. He's saying, listen up. To listen up. Because this is so important. And he says in verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. And that parable means he's comparing Israel's past to its present situation. He's comparing what happened in the past and what's going on at that moment. And in verse 2 again, he says, I will utter dark sayings from of old. And that's the bad news. It actually means that God's truth has been hidden. For a long time, the people of Israel have stopped talking about God's faithfulness and His strength and His love for them. They have kept quiet throughout those times. And then verse 3 says, Things that we have heard and known. And when we hear that word heard or hear in the Old Testament, to hear is not just to listen. To hear is to listen and then live it out. 
they start listening, the moment people start listening, that's when they also start living for God. That's been a spiritual drought that's been going on in Psalm 78. Truth has been hidden. God's truth has been hidden for far too long. And this is what's in the heart of Asaph, telling you and me that God's faithfulness is still true today and tomorrow and next week and next month and for the rest of our lives. Tell the next generation. Today I want to thank God again for, for my parents, for my dad and mom who are, this, who are here this morning. God has been very instrumental in leading me and my three siblings to the Lord. Uh, when we were in the Philippines, uh, we moved from one local church to another where the gospel is preached, where the good news is taught. God's word is edifying. God's word is important. How many of you believe that the church matters? The teaching that we hear Sunday after Sunday and in our small groups and in Sunday school. They're very, very important. And so my dad decided to move us to this church that would strengthen us, that would make us understand who God is, His character, and how much we are a sinner in need of a Savior. And in that local church, we got saved. We became followers of Jesus. My parents became believers first, and then we in turn got saved by God's grace. I also remember family nights. When we were in the Philippines, we would have the Bible open, and dad and mom, they would just open God's word, and we would just read, and, and they would just teach us. You know, regularly. I remember my mom uh, playing the piano. She was my first piano teacher. Uh, she was also our uh, piano player at church in the Philippines and also our organist. And so I would hear music at our home, in our house, regularly. Uh, she plays the hymns. She also likes to hum hymns or even sing hymns while she's at, you know, doing her household chores back then. And even today, once in a while, she would still sing some Christian music, hymns, and that keeps us focused on Him. When we hear God's songs, right, doesn't it make us align to Him? Maybe we're driving, we got the music going, or you have stuff in your smartphone. There's something about God's music that, that stirs our hearts, it excites us about who He is. We grew up that way. Music was very important in, our, in my family's uh, life. So when we moved here back in 1983, uh, we were teenagers, uh, you know, dad, my, my dad was just uh, the one who led the way and, and founded the local church for us in San Leandro, as many of you know. Um, he was unemployed. He drove a beat-up car. Didn't have a job, but the first thing in his agenda is for us to be part of a small church. A church that loves the Lord. That's the first thing that he did. In a way, my dad and mom, they were telling us the glorious deeds of the Lord. That's in verse 4. Look at the last part of that verse. But tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. An old hymn that we used to sing a lot, it's called Count Your Blessings. Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. Count Your Blessings. See what God has done. How many of you today have a testimony to proclaim? How many of us have testimonies, life stories that we can tell our friends and family members how great God is. Remember the song that we, that we, we sing, How Great Is Our God? Sing with me, How Great Is Our God. Church, 
We have a story to tell. Amen? We have the hope that the world does not have. The hope in Christ. Tell everyone the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. That's why hearing people's testimonies are encouraging to me. That's why we encourage people, especially if you are a church member, share your testimony, how you got saved. What was your life like before you came to know Christ? How did Christ save you? And what is Jesus doing now in your life? That's why we ask people to write down their testimony, turn it in, so we can read it, so we can be encouraged. And as Christians, we should never be ashamed. Amen? Maybe someone asked you, are you a Christian? Yeah, okay. What's your story? In a split second, but you know what to say, right? Amen? It's like, it should be automatic. Like, what's your name? My name is Glenn. It should be like that. And this is how Christ saved me. Man, I was like this. I was messed up. And then God saved me. And this was God doing in my life. Testimonies, life stories are very powerful. That's why movies will never go bankrupt. Because we love stories. That's why we go and watch movies. And you have a story to tell the world is dying without Jesus. You have a testimony. And for some, I don't know how you got saved. That's why we're asking you, how did you get saved? So, you know, I want to know. Shouldn't that be automatic for us, right? I mean, we want to know. I mean, how did you... So that I can be encouraged and built up. We want to invite you to share your life in your small groups or even in this Sunday gathering because we're not ashamed of Jesus. We're not ashamed of what He did for us. And so for those who haven't done it, turn in your, your, your testimony and uh, we'll ask uh, Chris to collect them if, uh, if you haven't done so in two weeks. It's, it's exciting. Tell the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. Testimonies. Is that what we want to? This is what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. This is what he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, those who are uh, they're abusive, verbally abusive, nor swindlers, uh, con, con artists, will enter the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That is a powerful statement. That's where you used to be. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, made right with God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And such were some of you. Friends, the church is not filled with perfect people. The church is filled with transformed sinners. Amen? We got ex-adulterers, ex-drunkards, ex-abusers. You name it. The church is full of former people. Ex kind of lifestyle. And such were some of you. Your testimonies matter. We can share that appropriately in good taste. Tell someone, tell the next generation about your life in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We are so messed up and sinful that God has to recreate us to be new creation. 
in Him. Tell the next generation how Jesus is the hero of your life and not us. We're just in the background. And it's really not about our work, our performance. It is Christ's performance on the cross. And He did it for us. Look at verse 5 here. He established a testimony in Jacob. Jacob, as you know, his name was uh, changed to Israel. And appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. Before we came to Christ, what's our mission statement? If it feels good, do it, right? Remember our former lives? Hey, it feel, feels good? Do it. If it doesn't hurt anyone, do it. That's, that was our mission statement. But now it's different. We have a different standard. We now have God's Word. We have a different mission statement. And just a little commercial this Wednesday and Thursday, we will discover our mission statements in terms of our life group. You and I must know our mission statement, why God created you to be and what you are to do so that we don't become too busy and become lazy. So that we can know our purpose here on earth. God's word is our standard. So we ask these questions. So what's the gospel got to do with it? What does the Bible say about this? If it's not a moral issue, we ask what is the wise thing to do? Those three questions must be asked by a true Christian. It's not, what does Glenn say? What does that guy say? What does she say? What does God's word say? What does the gospel have to do with this? Or what's the wise thing to do? That should be those questions. Because now we are changed. Tell the next generation of God's faithfulness to you and me. We have a different standard now. Verse 6. The next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. And arise and tell them to their children, so that they should not, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Look at verse 6 again. The next generation might know them. If you have kids today, you are thinking about your kids that they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Amen? We got one down, we got one to go. And that's our prayer. It's the best answered prayer a parent could ever have. It's their kids to become Christ followers. And it says here, and the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. Not only as a parent, as a follower of Jesus, not only we're, we're thinking about our kids, but we're actually already planning for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Certainly most of us will not be here anymore, but we are looking farther than our children. Let's think that way. Let's think farther than our children, our, our grandkids, and great-grandchildren. By God's grace, they will come to know Jesus. And then it says here, in verse 8, and they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Well, that implies something, doesn't it? Go, go to verse 5. It says here, the last part of verse 5, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. Who is responsible for teaching God's word to the family, to the children? Who is, who is responsible? Fathers are. In the Hebrew family, dads 
were responsible for teaching and instructing their children about God's Word. How often, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7 says here, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you, when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. How often, fathers? All the time. However much opportunities that we have, we praise God for our youth teachers, for Theo, for Jared, for Jane, for Marvin. And to God for them, amen? And our teachers that teach on Sunday mornings, te teaching our little kids about Jesus, about Jenny's teaching right now, about Achan and his sin, and God's forgiveness for us. We praise God for them and our wives. But at the end of the day, dads, you and I are the primary number one teacher in our homes. That's our role. You have a kid, you're a dad. God created to be a dad. We are called to teach them God's word. We praise God for our wives. They're also teaching our kids, but we are. We should be more mature than our wives. Amen? Fathers, we should be. We read God's word daily. That's one of the things that we do in our discipleship when we meet Twice a month, we challenge each other as dads. Did you date your son? Not only date via playing basketball, watching a movie, those are great. You know, fixing the car or whatever. But did you talk about God to him this week? Did you talk about how amazing, how faithful God is, how forgiving he is? Fathers, we are called to do this regularly. And not leave it, leave it to our youth group and our wives. We are the primary teachers of our kids. And maybe today you didn't grow up with a father like that. I mean, you know, maybe your your dad was not even a believer growing up. And, and I understand that. And I feel you. And I feel you. What you're going through. Ask God to give you the courage to start a new legacy right now. You know, Dad, you can do that. You know, your dad got saved later on. Maybe he's still not saved today. You can start this godly legacy and stop that streak and, and start a new one for the Lord. And maybe today, as, as dads, you haven't been leading your family to the Lord. Ask God for forgiveness. Talk to your wife and ask for her forgiveness. And then talk to your kids and ask for their forgiveness and say, you know what? Son, I haven't been hanging out, hanging out with you for a long time. I've been depending on the youth group on Fridays to teach you. We haven't been talking about God. Will you forgive me? Daughter, I haven't been teaching you what it means to be a woman of God. We haven't been seeing each other. And I'm depending on Light by the Bay. But come to understand that I'm, I'm the one to teach you. Will you have a date with me? Let's go out, have lunch, and let's open God's Word, pray for each other, what's going on in your life. Let's just relax and dig deep into God's Word. You can do that, fathers. We can start it right now. We can do that. Today, if you are a single man and you want to get married, in order for this to happen in your life, you must seek a mentor. You have to have a mentor to start a new godly legacy in your life. You cannot afford it. You will fail. I guarantee you will fail as a single man, even right now. And when you get married, please don't take your future wife with you to fail. Because you don't, you don't want to be with a mentor right now. So I challenge a single man here 
to think about your future, to tell the next generation, you need older men who are here to challenge you, to encourage you, to build you up. And we said before that those who are, who are in the 20s and 30s do not ask for help. Very few people who, who are in the 20s and 30s go for counseling because they know better. They know, they think they could handle everything. And again, we used to be like them, but we were wrong. We needed help. Single men, I challenge you, especially if, you're, you have a, if you have a girlfriend right now, you don't have one. You either get one or you break up with her. If that doesn't happen, maybe we'll have one of the people to tell you to break up with her. Because you're not growing. You're just wasting your life. So I say this with love, single men. Meet with a mentor. Get one. So that you can tell the next generation about God's faithfulness. In verse 7 and verse 8, especially in verse 8, it says, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. They were in 40 years in the wilderness, and a lot of them did not make it to the promised land. It was the parents, it was the kids who were able to go into the promised land. Why? They were rebellious, they were stubborn. They didn't want any advice. And God took their lives. That's what it's saying here. Look at some examples of their disobedience. Look at verse 10. They did not keep God's com covenant, but refused to walk according to His law. They forgot His works and the wonders that He had shown them. And then jump to verse 17. Well, verse 12, 16 is it's God's blessing on them. Parting of the Red Sea, you remember the story, right? In Exodus. Cloud in the morning, fiery light at night, as God was guiding them. All the blessings, the water that was provided for them. Look at verse 17. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the most high in the desert. 18. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rocks so the water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can He also give bread or provide meat for His people? Yeah, that's total disobedience. I mean, they just saw the Red Sea part. And three short chapters later, they're complaining, grumbling about God hating on Him. He doesn't provide for us. Testing God. Total rebellion, rebelliousness in their hearts. And then jump to verse uh, 38, uh, 30, um, 37. Rather, how God's faithfulness was still there. Look at verse 37. Their heart was not steadfast toward Him. They were not faithful to His covenant. Here's how God is so faithful to us. Look at verse 38. Yet He, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained His anger often and did not stir up all His wrath. He remembered, verse 39, that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yet God still provided for them. Friend, God's faithfulness to you is not based on how you're faithful to him. The reason why God is faithful to you is because he is loving to us. Isn't that amazing? And as Christians, a lot of times we blame ourselves, we condemn ourselves, we look back at our resume, it's horrible, I did this, I did that, I destroyed my family, I just did this. And we ought to grieve, yes. 
because we hurt and offended a holy God. But our Father is kind to us. He is loving to us all. His kindness to you is not based on how good you are. It's on how good He is. Understand that. Understand that. It's not based on our performance. It's not going to school. If you don't get an A, if you don't pass, then you fail. It's about God's love and kindness. He will go a long way when we understand that His faithfulness, faithfulness is not about us. It's really about Him. And we can read the rest of the verses here. And you can read at home and how amazing God is that He led them to safety so that they were not afraid. They dismissed Him. They disrespected Him. And God was still there with His people. Look at verse 10 again. I want to focus on the word covenant. They did not keep God's covenant. And then go, go to verse 37. Their heart was not steadfast toward Him. They were not faithful to His covenant. We all have covenants, right? If you have a job, you made a covenant with your, your employer, right? The company, you had a, a mutual agreement. You, you signed your pay, you know, the paperwork in your workplace. Number of hours, how much you pay, insurance and all that. You and I have a lot of covenant. And we see covenants also in, in weddings, right? The, the bride and groom have their own covenants, right? Uh, in sickness and in health and all that, saying, I will, I will covenant with you. So it's a mutual agreement. All the time we do this. Do you know God does covenant differently? Do you know God's covenant is always one way? It's never two way. That should encourage us. You see, He's going to covenant with you. He's still going to keep His promise. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because His covenant always comes through to us. Our covenant to Him, we fail Him all the time, don't we? We sin, we grieve Him. But His covenant stands true. He doesn't leave us. He does not forsake us. He does not look down on us. He's no longer angry on, on us because His wrath has been placed on Christ on the cross as believers. Church, be free today. Be free. Focus on God's faithfulness. That's what His covenant is all about. They disrespected Him. They refused to walk. And yet God was still walking with them. Romans 5 as we know, says, But God demonstrates His love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were still rebelling, hating on Him, telling Him to leave us alone, Christ did not wait for us to act, to act the right way. Christ never waited for us to clean our lives up. And while we were yet sinners, what did, he, what did He do? He died for you. He died for me. So, whenever you feel like you're about to condemn yourself, church, will you be reminded that He will still be faithful to you? Remind yourself that His faithfulness is dependent on His covenant. It's not about your performance. We will fail Him. Do we ask for His forgiveness? And His faithfulness is also involves His loving discipline. And He will discipline us because He loves us. He cares for us. So today, friend, have you been broken over your sins? If you are a follower of Jesus, a Christian today, raise your hand. If you are born again. Okay. God's faithfulness is on you. For someone here, have you been broken over your sins? Do you know Him? Have you been broken over your sins toward a holy God? Do you see Him 
as holy and you as a rebellious sinner and not a good person. You need a Savior. We need a Savior to save us from ourselves and hell. We need a faithful God who will always be with us in good times and in bad times. So friend, will you pray to Him? Will you cry out to Him right now in repentance? Tell Him, cry out to Him right now. Reach out to Him. See yourself as a sinner deserving of hell. And that you need Christ to save you. And when you do that, God will answer that prayer that He has planted into your heart. He will never leave us nor forsake us. That is my prayer. That is my desire for you today who have not given or surrendered their lives to Christ. Let me give you two homework assignment uh, today for all of us. Here's assignment number one. For all of us here, let me challenge you, encourage you. Will you share your testimony this week? So we got seven days to tell your testimony and life stories of how you came to Christ. Can we do that? Is that doable? I think it's doable, right? Share it with your neighbor, your friend, your classmate, your relative. For us fathers, can we spend time with our sons and daughters this week? Can we put that in our Google Calendar and place it in there and say, Son, daughter, let's have a day. Let's talk about God. That's the assignment. Another one is, share five things God has been faithful to you this week, last week, last year, five years ago, ten years ago. Five things God has been faithful to you. Can you share that with someone this week? I think that's reasonable, right? If you're a father today and grandfather, will you raise your hand? If you're a father today, raise your hand. Grandfather, raise your hand also. If you're a grandfather, Lolo, if you are Lolo today, raise your hand. Okay, there you go. A little translation there. <laughs> if you don't mind, I want to ask you to stand where you are. If you're a dad and you're a grandfather, I want to pray for us today. Can you please stand, if you don't mind, just where you are? I'm going to pray for, all, for us dads and grandfathers. We have a responsibility, don't we? We have a responsibility to tell the next generation of how great God is. That when we fail Him, He will never fail us. He's always faithful to us. What a privilege for us. To have that honor of telling our kids, our wives, our friends. Will you bow your heads with me? Let's all pray. God, thank you again for this short time of Psalm 78. Thank you for Asaph, for this praise and worship leader. And that you have anointed to write this song, to talk about you, your character, and how amazing and faithful you are to us all. God, we have dads and grandfathers here who have a great opportunity to influence the next generation. God forgive us when we fail you, when we don't take time talking to our grandkids, our sons, our daughters. God, you have commanded us to tell the next generation of your glorious deeds of the Lord and your might and the wonders that He, that you are doing in our lives and have done in the past. So friends, today, if you are a single man, as we continue, if you are a single man, as we continue this time of prayer, will you also stand up? All the single men here, will you please stand up? Let me just pray for you. 
Let's continue to bow our hands and pray. God, I want to pray, Lord, for the men here at Life by the Bay. God, they also have the influence of creating and starting a new godly legacy in what you will call them. If it's marriage, God, may it be so. God, help them to have a mentor. God, break down the stinking thinking that they're thinking right now. Why not to have a mentor? But to have an older man who is godly that will coach them. God, some of them are part of a basketball team. They know how important to have, to have a coach to lead them. How much more it is important for them to have a coach in their lives, to teach them the ways of the Lord, to teach them what it means to be a single man for the Lord, to teach them one day that they will become a husband, a godly husband, and a godly father. It is their calling and their mission to be that, if that's what you're calling. I God, also want to ask the men here who, who are married, if you're married today, if you're a man, please stand up too. Please stand. I want to pray for you too. God, as husbands, we also have a responsibility to tell the great news to our wives. Oh God, let us not forget our wives whom you have given to us. God, whatever we heard today in our small groups from your word, Give us the courage, God. Give us the confidence to take time this week, an hour, and maybe turn off watching the TV, a couple of TV shows, and just like say, honey, let's talk about God. Let's talk about what we just learned last Sunday, or this Sunday morning, or Wednesday night, or Thursday night. Let's talk about God. Let's talk about how faithful He is, and let's pray together. But God, give us that courage to do this regularly so that we will not have a heart of stubbornness and rebelliousness in our hearts. That we will not be like the fathers who have forgotten you. God, help us not to be dependent on a Sunday morning, opening our Bibles only this time, but regularly, God, God, for all of us, you are faithful. A lot of times we're not. Thank you that you have counted us as righteous because of what Christ did for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.